a new exciting open source blockchain platform has been born. Its core mission is to develop easier and more affordable tools for everyone to be able to create tokens and NFTs. For the first time, we're introducing the innovative Tokel platform, a fully decentralized community-driven project with contributors globally. It offers many new powerful features for artists, content creators, and event organizers, and token owners. Tokel is building the future of tokenization together with the help of Komodo Technologies. Creators and users have the freedom to create, to hold, buy, sell, and trade tokens with ease. Developers have the freedom to build on top of the platform's layer. Tokel has features such as simplified token creation tools, token decks, and NFT marketplace. The NFT creation process has an extremely low barrier to entry. Businesses and individuals can now benefit from the token economy by using tokens in everyday life. A built-in decentralized exchange enables peer-to-peer -peer trading. Tokel.io, the future of tokenization to NFT and beyond. Greetings, I'm Giuliano. Welcome to Tokel Talk. And in today's episode, we'll be talking about using NFTs in the real world. We're joined today to talk about tokenizing all things. We have Frank Chipkema, artist from Amsterdam, and Exile13 from THC, the hemp coin. We'll also be doing an NFT giveaway, so watch out for the form shared during the stream. And if you would like to be a future guest on the show, visit the website tokel.io slash tokeltalk. Scroll down, fill in the form uh, to join us and talk as a guest on the show. So everyone, we are here, but before we get started, here's Dream Tim with some NFT stats. Hi, Dream Tim. Thank you, Giuliano. Hi, everyone. Here are some news from the NFT world this week. In terms of NFT sales, 15,000 NFTs were sold this week for the total value of 40 million US dollars. This has been pretty much an ape week. The seven top NFT sales were all bored apes ranging from $483,000 with the most expensive one going for 250 ETH which is around $720k at current rates. Abu Dhabi rolls out draft recommendations for NFT trading. The Emirates Special Economic Zone might grant licensed exchanges the right to trade non-fungible tokens. Another piece of crazy news, an NFT collector mistakenly sold a 1 million drawing of a rock for fractions of pennies. There's also rumors that Madonna will be entering the metaverse. That is all I have from the NFT world for you this week. All right. Thank you, Dream Tim. That was a lot of aping and you said $40 million. So that's quite some, some money right there. And, you know, I think the idea here is that anything that has value will be tokenized. Uh, that's the, the theme of the show in some sense. We are talking with a couple of special guests here. We've got Frank Jepkama, an artist from Amsterdam. And we've got uh, Exile13 from The Hemp Coin. So I would just like to bring us in with our guests here. Jep, Frank, nice yeah, to meet you. Good evening. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us today. And why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, what you're doing, your background? Yeah, so I was, uh, my background is industrial design. Uh, I have my design practice since 20 years. Um, and I have been diversifying quite a lot from product design to interior design and even towards uh, autonomous arts with uh, large installations in the public space. But my work is very, very much anchored in the, in the physical world. But my tools are all uh, digital. And since uh, a year, I've been looking at NFTs. And since half a year, I've started launching two collections. And yeah, I'm here to share my journey uh, from physical to digital and, uh, and back to physical again. Wow, that's, a, that's incredible. It's pretty impressive as well. And it suits our purposes here. You talked about autonomous art as the insta installations. Yeah, so my, my big clients are, for example, the city of Amsterdam, where I do installations in the public space. 
And often my work is on the border between functional design and aesthetics and uh, conceptual art, actually. Uh, to give you example, for example, there's a, a large tunnel built in Amsterdam and it, it needed these uh, technical extraction towers. Uh, but they commissioned it to me to make an art installation out of this technical installation. So that was quite a, an interesting point of view to mix something very uh, useful and something very artistic. And the result is really a, a sculptural work of which nobody really knows that it, it's a very technical object for a tunnel. Wow. Yeah, that is very impressive. Okay, well, we definitely look forward to hearing more about what you're doing. You're, you're also very interested in the NFTs, NFT world, right? Yeah, so my first uh, connection with blockchain was in uh, 2018, actually at the top of the market. And like many noobs, I sort of started investing at the wrong time. But I did develop a, a passion for blockchain. And the NFT craze that started last summer, yeah, that, that really fascinated me because it started to affect my profession. And I thought well, that I just had to jump into this, this, this new domain. Yeah. Hmm. It was affecting your profession in the sense that uh, art was the, a big factor in NFTs or something other than that? Yeah, well, it was apparent that the art world was picking up on, on blockchain and that was sort of unexpected because it's, it's a very technical world. It's a, a world very much based on economics. And th these two things are sort of opposed to arts, right? So it was quite uh, fascinating to, to see that the art world was the first, yeah, domain that was really embracing uh, nfts in such an incredible way and then the whole contrast between the way the public or the general public perceives it as a sort of a, a yeah gold rush and a superficial craze but at the same time there's a whole world behind it of, of functionalities utilities communities uh, and the whole that, that that's the typical story of blockchain is that the mainstream media just doesn't get it <laughs> And, uh, and 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 uh, what is happening to uh, to NFTs today is what happened to blockchain in 2018. So the the general public sort of, of gets a distorted image of uh, of it through the media, and I think it's the same thing now with the art world. But it's very interesting to see how it's it's picked up and how major players are taking it seriously. Mm, yes, indeed, Sirius is right, and and based on some of those numbers, Dream Team uh, read off to us that, that it's very serious money. And, but the art world has always been about serious money. But I, I, I don't think I want to get too much into that just, just at this moment. In terms of technologies, there are two things that pop into my mind is that, well, you mentioned that you actually already, your art kind of goes between the physical and the digital world. You said you use digital tools. And it, it also makes me think that you talked about the art world embracing the, the blockchain, so to speak. And it makes me think that art has always been about being creative with certain tools. And producing things so what is a, a for for example a green line is that that a, a city or a, a place where artists community is strong is often an innovative city the creative class is always a, a, an important driver of uh, innovation and you see this you see this with blockchain as well now fascinating well speaking of um, moving forward with innovations so we also have exile 13 here exile how's it going today and thank you so much for joining us Yes, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Wonderful. Well, we're glad to have you. Um, you have also a perspective um, that we can learn from as well. You are dealing with um, cannabis, uh, hemp, with the hemp coin. So previously one of the earliest altcoins and uh, since then has migrated uh, to Komodo as a, as a Komodo smart chain. So yeah, do you want to tell us a little bit about what's going on over there? Yes, I appreciate it really focused on real world use cases in terms of the the token tokenization of the marketplace or the ecosystem things that are units of value in different companies or different structures can be uh, tokenized and then traded globally so we're seeing real world use cases uh, for example in a realty.co they've got a uh, crowd sharing realty company. In this same way, we're providing the ecosystem or agriculture market, specifically spotlighting hemp in this this first iteration. We'll be providing this ability to farmers or people growing hemp uh, globally. So uh, like a seed, 10 seeds, let's say a plant, a specific genetic, let's say you've been working, geneticists has been working on 
making a seed grow a specific way for a specific product and he wants to have royalties paid out, always tied back, you know, to him instead of kind of being censored or permission based. So real world use cases is definitely something that the hemp coin is working towards. I, I came on from working with Pirate, one of the Moto's ecosystem projects, and just hit the ground running and so the real world use cases like a gallon of biodiesel, bale of hemp, uh, really any unit of value that you know people are using, you can make bioplastics from hemp. So certain iterate testing for data in a certain aspect, you want to have the same being able to represent it across the board and the audibility of the blockchain or technology of the blockchain is very useful in this aspect. That's good. It, it's it's helpful to understand that you you mentioned that any of these values can be tokenized and then monitored, tracked, um, transferred in terms of title and ownership. And we, we can get to these ideas because uh, I guess that'll be a bit more of a broad question because it is the type of technology that's, how do you say, less tangible, right? Somewhat less tangible, even though there's the devices, the computers, the phones and all that. But it's really about the information. So yeah, like Exile, in, in the business you're involved with, do you see... The technology still needs to catch up or or what are you seeing right now yeah i appreciate that and you kind of hit the nail on the head right there with the devices so you know people out in this out on the farm let's say in the mountains somewhere in cambodia or colombia you know high in the mountains there might not have the best cell signal based on the structure or the technology requirements that they're currently operating in so different um, low band or, you know, there's solutions available that I've found. Uh, definitely when we're pressed, I think we find the best of ourselves in a manner. So, um, you know, it's not really, the solution isn't made until it's really needed in kind of an aspect and maybe has been created. You just got to go find it. And the, the, the coding part, you know, the, the software is there and the hardware it definitely is there just need to link these up in a certain aspect so it's not creating a device that you know is detrimental in terms of waste and is operational and doesn't require a lot of you know upkeep let's say you know batteries and stuff like that so like solar powered options and but yeah if uh, a blockchain is fundamentally based upon this technology and until it's running yeah, maybe it's more of a, of a time thing, right? It just takes time for technologies to infiltrate um, into the everyday life. And so maybe at this point, we're just going to back it up. And uh, firstly, also say hi to uh, Nutella. He's here from the Tokol team as well. Hi, Nutella. Hey, how are you? Um, as Exile was talking, I was thinking of uh, Tokol platform and NSPV. And I'm wondering, like, for example, are there benefits to NSPV that, that help in these type of ways? Yeah, definitely. And SPV basically just gives all of those, you know, mobile users and users that don't have good access to uh, computing power an easy way to interact with blockchain and you know use utilize the blockchain ledger and all of the features that come along with it. So uh, that's the the biggest benefit in in that aspect because you know that whole supply chain that Exile is talking about has to have access to. Uh, the blockchain technology in some way shape or form and uh, and that will be key to enabling that across the board nice so that's the nspv technology i'm I'm very still very curious about it it seems like a it's just unique compared to other things people here you're listening to toko platform you might have an idea about that already but it is one of those technology pieces that's still kind of in the background and um, we don't quite fully understand its capabilities and its powers just yet is that right I would suggest that you know the team have a, a pretty good understanding of where it can head, but it's it's trying to uh, gain that that broader understanding across the community and to people outside the community on how it can be used. You know, for these real world use cases, for example, we're still building out the technology itself to make it more usable for you know these supply chains and different types of um, you know mobiles, for example, is is not yet supported, but uh, is definitely. Uh, on the cards to support. Um, so there's a bit of work to go. I'd say we, you know, we have a good understanding of where it can go. We just have to build it out and, and build that uh, education piece. Yeah, I think that's kind of what I meant in that sense that it, it takes time for it to be seen like what is even possible um, after 
we start to use these things, we, we don't, we, it's hard to imagine what can be in the future and which makes this episode a little bit challenging in some sense, this discussion. So I do want to ask, like, for example, Jeff, I'm just going to ask you here, what are tokens and NFTs good for? Like from what you've seen, you got very interested in it. What's their practical value? What do you think? Yeah, well, the, the, I think blockchain is going to affect all domains that are not affected by real world yet or, or that aren't solved by, by real world things like the blockchain is very logical in a, in a context like the metaverse. But in the context of physical products, it's still more of a symbolic connection. Um, and I, I was interested in VeChain. Uh, for, I've been interested for a few years and somehow I'm surprised that I still can't buy goods, luxury goods or, or, or even food products and that I still cannot scan them with my phone and see how they are uh, linked to the blockchain and, and to prove their authenticity or their origin. Because these ideas have been here for a few years, but, but they are really being adopted in places where uh, the analog world, uh, let's say for the analog world, the solutions that are solvable by analog means, they will stay for a while before they are revolutionized by the blockchain. But for the whole digital realm, uh, the blockchain is is totally adopted as we speak. Uh, I think that's that's where we stand right now. Yeah, that makes sense. So you touched on a few. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. And that and you touched on a few of the type of use cases or things that we might look to use this technology for, including uh, you talked about transferring or just basically understanding the knowledge of of the product information, luxury goods you mentioned, or yeah. Uh, or uh, for food, food products, and yeah. understanding their origination and, and things like that, right? The date, all their data. Yeah, absolutely. That's all data. But for me as a creator, what really uh, is fascinating is the possibility to sell digital information as a product. And there's a, a, a what we are seeing in this design scene happening right now is that, for example, a, a 3D designer uh, would create an NFT collection, a furniture that is that you can sell as NFT, but once you own the NFT, you can 3D print it. So you don't have a normal ma manufacturing uh, system, but a totally decentralized manufacturing. And you see the convergence wow. of things like 3D printing and blockchain. And these are two new digital domains that are logical together. Wow. And I, I'm, I'm, for example, right now I'm working on a collection of jewelry uh, rings that will be uh, generated. It will be a generative uh, collection of rings. And, and actually the NFT holder can print himself the ring and he can choose the material. It can be a cheap ring made of plastic, but he can also print it out of gold. That's his choice. But the 3D file he gets through his NFT is actually uh, indifferent to the materialization. Uh, it's his choice to 3D print it anywhere. And that is really interesting. So, so it's, it's the, yeah. You know. Wow, that's fascinating. I think, uh, I think Tim mentioned this concept last podcast, actually, Fidgetal. Is it, would that yeah. be the correct use of that? Yeah, I've heard that term before. There's a there's a, co a company in Holland that is already doing it. It's called Super Toys. If you want to check it out, they they have 3D uh, furniture that you can buy as NFT and then print yourself. Yeah, su super interesting concept, especially you know, as an NFT, as a one-off piece. Uh, owning you know the rights to to creating it is is quite interesting. I wonder if that would ever expand into you know businesses purchasing specific designer label products to then mass produce you know one whether those rights you know the the ip and the copyright and everything comes along with them or not that would be an interesting thought yeah that's that, that's also the, the decentralization of ip or is also very interesting that if you own the nft you are allowed to commercialize that that specific version of the product yeah you're allowed to print it on t-shirts or you're allowed to print it to sell it to do whatever you want you can but but that gives a lot of power to the individual uh, creator to to yeah. yeah towards his publics as how he likes to see his work being being used. Yeah, definitely. And I think for the owner, right, like the the creator has incentive to to benefit the owner of the token across a long like a long period of time. And one way of doing that is giving the you know the the IP uh, or the intellectual property rights to the owner, such that you know they benefit from any you know, notary awareness of the actual token itself. So a lot of people talk about, you know, right click and save and you get that JPEG and then you can print it and hang on the wall. But the way that I look at that concept is that 
the popularity of a specific NFT brings further value to the owner itself, especially in the case where you might have to pay the owner to, to actually create it or um, the owner of the NFT can benefit from you know, having a wider audience to capture and, and sell items to or you know, be more well-known in the space, basically. There's a lot of benefits to that as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's, it, the NFT is a really a tool for a creator to, to get closer to his, to his community. And, uh, and, uh, and I guess the, the, his public gets to really get involved in, in the journey of the creation and the production. And there's a lot of layers that, uh, that, that are really interesting yeah, and that, that go to totally beyond the simple JPEG. What other, you know, I guess talking about hardware specifically, because we're talking about this digital, physical, digital combination where you buy something, uh, you buy an NFT that gives you the rights to actually create it using, you know, a 3D printer. What other, you know, what other tech, like hardware technologies can you see being used in this, in this space as well? I, I was hoping we would see a lot of hardware in the supply chain. And, and that is what I'm missing at the moment, that I, I'm not seeing that, like proof of, of uh food quality that for example uh, uh, some you can prove the freshness of a product that it's never been below some sort of temperature during its uh, uh, logistical journey but all these tools the problem with these tools is that they can fail and the blockchain cannot fail in principle but these individual tools can fail in these sort of concepts uh, i think that's one of the the difficulties i think it's a growth area um, i've seen a, a few hardware options um, specifically for the supply chain because i think there's a lot of a lot of money going into that industry specifically with blockchain so uh, i've seen a couple of options but this idea of you know purchasing an nft and and being able to convert it into a, a physical object is is really quite fascinating uh, because you're almost you know you're almost owning well you own the rights to it you're almost owning any future you know sales or creation of those things you can create as many of those things as you want and on sell them or display them or you know uh, make something out of those physical physical items whilst also you know being able to prove that you own the underlying uh, ip and own the underlying nft of that yeah in relation to jewelry i'm very interested in, in in the idea that you buy a physical piece to wear in the in the real world but you can connect it to an nft that enables you to wear the exact same piece in the metaverse and then really linking the digital and the physical together. I think that's very interesting. In the whole fashion uh, industry, I think all these concepts will be very, very interesting. Yeah, so it becomes more than just an NFT because you know, you're know you owning the rights to the, the 3D model but uh, that you can then print, but you also have this uh, metaverse-based graphic that you can put on an avatar, but you also have you know the rights to this physical item that you've then created type thing. So yeah, there's multi-layered, uh, NFT. That's a that's a whole lot of value to to the owner of that specific token. Yeah, and and a very simple use case, for example, is Instagram influencers. They they post every day, but they don't want to wear the same thing every day. So it can become quite expensive to change your clothes every day. But if you have a, a digital collection of clothes, that's actually pretty cheap to 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 have a lot of a, a wide collection of clothing NFTs, and enable you to with a filter to change your clothing very fast for your selfies. I think that's also a mind boggling uh, application. Is that like a, an AR type thing, augmented reality where? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It yeah. puts your NFT item of clothing over the top of the picture of you. Exactly. And then also dynamically. So if you move, the, 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 your, your clothes are actually moving with you. Yeah, wow. Well, okay. That's like yeah. a, you know, AR metaverse. Yeah. But that's a, a yeah, that's a very, simple application that makes an enormous sense i think yeah and i do get also the sense that it's 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 already happening it's being built out but we're just not seeing it until it's going to explode and it just becomes much more ubiquitous in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis i get the sense that it doesn't all happen at once so then it is happening now. It's just that we're not really seeing it. You, um, and it's not fully, full, it's because it's not in the visible realms yet. Like you mentioned, Jeff, about buying luxury goods and that sort of thing and not, uh, or for the food and not being able to track it through the blockchain yet. And I guess that's just because it's not in that visible layer yet. It's not being done actually yet, but it's there. It's almost there. And I think the more people are using it to find out what it's good for, 
then it's going to become more and more prevalent in our in our society. And I think maybe also uh, bigger businesses they move slower in some sense, maybe so it might take longer for that to to really be fully up and running. Yeah. But in terms of yeah, like in terms of the project you were talking about about owning the data to create a physical product. That stuff is fascinating. And uh, you're right, it, it really does blend well together. The 3D printing and the NFT, probably just talk just about that. But there's so much more to talk about. I mean, you, you, you had touched on it a number of times about ownership and transfer of ownership and um, benefits of the value accruing through the ownership. Mm -hmm. And so um, did you want to talk a little bit about that too? You know, you have had mentioned about uh, communities and how communities can benefit from NFTs and the tokenization. I think NFTs enable like small companies or artists to issue stocks of their projects or, or of their companies without being a major player or anything. You know, I see my the, the people that buy my NFTs as sort of uh, investors and stockholders in my in my projects, and uh, I feel an obligation towards my and it's still a, a pretty small community, but I feel an obligation to not uh, to, to to serve them and to take them with me into the things I want to do in the metaverse. And uh, I haven't f felt so much involvement in the physical world as I'm feeling right now in, in, in that six month I've been doing NFTs with the people that are uh, like Casper that is sitting here. I've, me I've met so many people and the enthusiasm is incredible. And I, I notice that the people that buy an NFT, they really feel involved. And I, th I think that's super powerful. And, and it totally goes beyond the, the whole idea of it's just a superficial uh, JPEG or whatever. Yeah, and I, I think it's really a shame that that the, the media is, just focuses on on the money and on the, these extravagant extravagant uh, stories about NFTs going for millions. Because the the whole layering with with uh, and, and the future towards uh, a three dimensional internet, where we we don't go, you know, it, the the implications for retail are such so immense. Also, that you can go to a, a, sh a Nike shop uh, with your profile and. The, the, in the metaverse and the shop knows exactly uh, the size of your foot and will display the, the shoes digitally and and then you, you order it and you get the nft but you also get the shoe in your post box i mean all that stuff is it's just mind blogging I, i'm just an independent designer and i i really feel these tools can be very valuable just after a few months working with them i think the important part of what blockchain gives compared to you know what is currently on offer with centralized systems is the ownership piece of that data so the person themselves owns all of that data and has the ability to um, you know either commercialize or uh, has control over that information rather than you know big companies on selling it without you being aware basically such that you know when you rock up and you go to the nike store or whatever you have to scan in a specific wallet which has all that data or you know you opt in to give them that information and then they may pay you specifically for whatever information you're giving them but it's like directly towards you rather than you know they get that off the last sale of your credit card because your credit card processor was collating information and then on selling that to Nike who then knows your name and your shoe size so they already have your shoe in stock you know, there's a, a slight difference there. And I think it's the control of your own data rather than, you know, entrusting other people or basically not having an option for other people not to collect your data. Yeah, definitely. And that's why I believe in the in the blockchain version of the metaverse and not the centralized uh, Facebook version. I mean, that's, that's pretty clear. Yeah, definitely. Um, Jeff, so we, we were just curious also, you had meant, so you and Nutella were just talking about like owning our own data. Um, and I think that's that's another thing that the NFTs help us with in our daily lives is is our identity and all of our data. We we get to own our data, and um, and benefit from that from the value because our our data undoubtedly has has value. Um, so I think that's an, an important thing to consider as well. Would would, would you say? Is, is that specifically for me? Yeah, sorry about that. Yes, for sure. Also, Nutella, though, you guys were kind of both going uh, back and forth about it. But I'll say that uh, Web3, like the core um, ideology of Web3 is to give individuals ownership of their own data. And that will underpin all of you know the technologies and all of the offerings that we have going forward, rather than, like I said, having big companies own, own all of that data. So I, I personally think that's incredibly important. Uh, and the Web3 technologies are going to enable that where, 
you know, you log into things using your, your crypto address or one of your many crypto addresses, you know, that, that type of thing. Yeah. One of the applications that, that really surprises me that it's still not there is, is voting. Like all the problems in the USA with the, with the, 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 the falsification of votes that could be solved so easily with blockchain. And somehow it's not in the debate. Nobody's talking about this. Yeah. Yeah, I'd suggest okay. I'd suggest that it's a, an incredibly hard thing to convince people to utilize a uh, a technology that's seen so negatively in in a lot of ways um, because of the association with cryptocurrencies. Yeah. You know, from a government perspective, at least. Yeah. So so hopefully for the next generations, it will be uh, more more easy to adopt these things. Yeah, as more knowledgeable yeah. people come through and. I'm more open yeah. to that type of thing. I'm sure it will, but disruptive technologies are always a bit that that way where, you know, the big slow governments don't want to uh, partake in using disruptive technologies until they're, you know, foolproof, basically. Just before you go on to that, uh, answer that question, I did want to just also recognize that amongst the uh, Komodo smart chain family, there is also the Varus coin, which uh, the Varus various id and the voting idea that concept um, is is tied together and so there are definitely bright minds working on these solutions and uh, you're right jep it would be very welcome to have auditability and full transparency in that sense and also at the same time privacy like the the proper blend of privacy and transparency i think is also what this type of technologies offer us i have a question for exile if i could yeah go for um, it yeah, Excel. How do you use um, tokens, NFTs, or how can you see them being used for provenance along the, I guess, the growing stage all the way to distribution for THC? Uh, real world use cases is definitely where we're focused on, and inside the grow or dispensary or farm, uh, people have the opportunity to where you were kind of alluded to earlier in terms of uh, crowd sharing. You know, individual temperatures or you know batch. Certain things in terms of daily fluctuations don't really need to be tokenized, but, you know, batch tracking and then, of course, crowd sharing. So if a farm in Germany is in compliance and available to sell each share of their company, they can tokenize part of that. And you'd be able to, you know, say, own a plant in Ethiopia from, you know, Germany. Yeah, nice. Yeah, that's super interesting, I guess. That's the that's where the power of you know, tokenization and and blockchain and uh, actually owning that. I'd be interested to understand how how you could log you know from growing to production using blockchain. I guess it's more of like a supply chain type thing. But how can you prove the? Because uh, one of the things uh, Frank mentioned, I think it was was understanding. Oh, it might have been you actually understanding the process of. When you buy something, what where what has it done in the past? How do you prove where it's been? Right. Uh, what conditions that it's been under? You know, all those all the bits of information that you otherwise would have never been able to collect as an end user. How how would you see tokens addressing that? Yeah, certain uh, like bat, we were talking about batch tracking and food and knowing where it's being uh, originated from, how it's been maintained or and or destroyed or uh, harvested. So or you know extracted let's say those as long you know one of the pitfalls would be the devices right so we come up to a standard of organization with a certain device manufacturer to say you give us a certain device that always does x and we're going to you know we're going to go with you because you know we need a standard of immutability on our input side we can have a, you know various fluctuations of course you know, accounting for a certain error that's uh, involved as well. But yeah, having a standard of organization to where these places, you know, bio, uh, one one system already in place is called BioTrack. One system, uh, another system is called Metric. And these systems are used with QR codes, IR scan, scanner devices, cameras, uh, certain GPS locations to monitor and standardize this data now the more data you know not everything needs to be input that's what i was saying not everything needs to be tokenized right so but large groups large large sets to where 
it is under compliance. It is under regulation. Most of these plants, specifically cannabis. Now we get it off into hemp. That goes into more of the carbon credit tracking. So um, building a carbon credit tracking platform and a education platform that will be tokenized uh, to where people will have a, a standard of these these two things going forward, knowing how to grow the hemp plant and then uh, being able to trade it in a sense globally. You're saying that uh, using this tech that you, you, know, you could have your hemp in your hand and then go on to the blockchain and have a look at the photos of you know, the plant that that came from and the location of where that came from and that sort of thing? Correct, correct. Working with certain camera data to be able to input that in an easy way so it's not too bulky. And then, yeah, definitely all the, you know, a farm and in, in the sticks and, and, you know, rural might, might have a lesser data, you know, less data than uh, somebody that's growing indoor with the dispenser with all the bells and whistles. So, we're looking to have this option, hemp track, and as an option with a specific, you know, devices, a specific standard that is low cost to the farmer, but is also able to monitor, create, and audit as well. Yeah, I think that uh, you know tokens enable that and that that provenance, uh, understanding where item has came from, and the whole process of that will be you know, a really big growth industry. And as I kind of talked about earlier, like there's there's a lot of hardware options for supply chains to consider in this space. Um, I think it'll be a fact of, you know, making it easier for everybody along that supply chain process to interact with the blockchain. And, uh, and that's where I mentioned, you know, the technologies that we're kind of focusing on uh, is to try and enable that. But I think there's still, you know, a long way to go. But I like that idea of, you know, having QR codes for different people in the process to be able to track exactly what's going on. And I've seen particular hardware pieces that will track temperature, location, and a whole bunch of other bits and pieces that you can just like, if it's a big item, you can just clip onto it. So say, for example, going back to Frank, like if you had a, if you made a, a really big piece that was um, sensitive so, to a certain temperature, uh, you could create that yourself and sell it to somebody, you know, via a token, you know, ship it out to them, put this um, specific little gadget onto it or within the packaging of it and then you would be able to monitor real time the temperature of that item uh, because of you know the sensitivities of, of, around that temperature so uh, a lot of a lot of growth space in that area and you know the blockchain technology will solve that i think the tokenization aspect will be interesting because you have you know you have proof of ownership through a token but then you can add a bunch of data you know in, in various ways on top of that token, which gives it almost a history as well, uh, which is super interesting. And and one of the things that you know I'm gonna I'm gonna find interesting in the in the Tockle ecosystem with the Cyber Commodos launch that we've just had, which was uh, quite successful. I'm pretty stoked to see uh, the collection start to build in in Tockle, but is understanding you know who's who has owned a specific Cyber Komodo in the past. So uh, you know it might have been a notable person in the ecosystem that's owned that cyber Komodo in the past you'll be able to look on the blockchain and see like that that address specifically if you knew that was theirs um or it you know it came from a certain creator then that would have a value in and of itself so uh, there's a lot of you know a lot of avenues we can go down here uh, to try and bridge that that real world uh use case but um it kind of gets me excited and i think about too much at once so apologies if i'm <laughs> kind of rambling there but yeah no worries it's good it's all good and uh, Jeff, so what did you what did you think of that? And I also do want to hear about what you think about uh, like the fractionalization of, of the NFTs you were talking about earlier. Yeah. So so um, what I find fascinating is is specifically in the in the art world is if you buy buy a piece of physical art, it will just disappear into your living room and and it will basically uh, not be alive anymore. It will be in, in, your, in your living room. There will be a few people, a few friends that will be able to see it. Whereas the digital version of an artwork has a life of its own because uh, as, you, as you just mentioned, uh, uh, you can always track the, the ownership. It has a, a market system around it that is uh, fluctuating continuously. There are people buying, selling. And this idea that art is, is 24 seven available uh, and also available for others to see so that uh, 
you can you can just show your collection without doing any efforts you know and i think that's where uh, nfts have a function of a, of a sort of status symbol uh, like art that has for your living room but now it's on a on a global platform and i think that that explains part of the success also yeah i'm, I'm diverging a bit i think but no that's great that's perfect yeah. that's good and, 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 and also the idea that you can take a physical uh, artwork, like let's let's say the uh, uh, famous 17th century uh, painting hanging in a museum, and the museum could actually issue ownership of that work through NFTs by fractionalizing it, and you could be part of the owners of a of a painting that's been made hundreds of years ago, uh, and it, and it gives a chance for a museum to refinance themselves or whatever it's i mean every time i look at this space every time I, I see possibilities it's just incredible you had talked about like the possibility with your community as well uh with fractionalizing ownership and their participation with you so obviously as a creator this is something very meaningful for you yeah for example i could i could uh, uh create a space in the metaverse that would be like uh, i have this 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 jewelry piece that's called the bling bling. It's it has uh, religious connotations, but it's it's made of all these commercial brand logos. Uh, Is that the one in your avatar? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's the one in my avatar, and I put some links in in the in in your uh, chat room. Yeah. To the work. Right. Yeah, exactly. And um, well, what I'm thinking, of, for example, there will be 160 owners of my NFT, and I want to give them the possibility to to go to. A, a sort of shrine or chapel in the metaverse and it will be sort of a, a platform to talk about branding and, uh, and and i'll try to connect some sort of themes to it but i want the people to have the nft to feel the the sort of ownership of that place also uh, and and it's very virtual but i think it will be feel very real for the people that suddenly have access to the space in the metaverse and yeah you asked earlier with which projects am I really uh, enthusiastic about? And there's one that that I've been talking about convergence of all these technologies. And I think the the gaming technology, especially uh, Unreal Engine, is going to give a huge impulse to the metaverse in in the sense of uh, that it finally looks like something that is uh, yeah professional or, or or like almost realistic enough to be really pleasing. That's what I don't really like about Decentraland and. Uh, a sandbox it's that it's still very childlike but i think we're on the verge of of seeing a huge uh, revolution also in in metaverse projects that are merging with gaming technology and nfts as well yeah i'm definitely very interested to see that as well i've always seen uh you know play to earn gaming i think is is brought a, a different light using nfts and tokens and we've kind of discussed that previously but i think uh yeah just traditional non play to earn gaming using nfts and you know, allowing players to benefit off secondary markets is a is a huge growth area. I definitely agree, and I'm I'm in, interested to see Unreal and Unity uh, pick up pick that up. Yeah, I'm, per I'm personally looking at a project called Network. I don't know if you, if you know it, but it's it's uh, it's not very well known yet. But it's a metaverse based on the Unreal Engine. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. What uh, I. I guess this is a question for both of you and, and Frank, you can answer first, but what other uh, real world use cases do you see, um, you know, whether they're implemented now or, or growth, um, you know, growth area for the industry in the future? Real world, yeah. Um, well, most of the things we, we, we mentioned, I, I think fashion is going to be huge for, for sure. And, and the, the, the combination of the physical piece and, and the digital piece in fashion makes, it makes a lot of sense. I think more the, the more it's it's linked to the artistic domain, the faster it will go. Because, for example, we we've, we've been talking about cars being connected to uh, to NFTs, like you could see the, the the your mileage and have a blockchain proven mileage on your car. I mean, these are ideas we've been talking about for five or six years, and they're still not there. You know, so I don't know why, but there's in the physical world, it's, if it's already solved by analog technology, it's going to be difficult to penetrate. But if it's a digital context, then it's going to make a lot of sense very fast. But I hope we will see yeah, a, a, a digital or, or cars that are NFTs at the same time. I mean, it will be amazing. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, I think the problem there, and we may have discussed this previously, is that you know really big business has a huge cost to change. So if they want to change to you know say, I mean, it would take a company like Tesla to to be like, hey, instead of having 
your car VIN number or your car ID, it's now a token ID. And the car itself, because it's connected to the internet, uh, automatically uploads data um, associated with that vehicle uh, for, you know, uh, historical purposes and to be able to prove exactly what happened. So when you go to sell it on the secondary market, that is immutable data. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see that, but I agree that, you know, the digital stuff can move a lot more quickly because people can go out there and create what it, whatever it is they want to create um, with a low, you know, a low cost associated with it. But when it comes to big business, government, policy changes, or all that sort of stuff, very, very slow process. So and the cost to change um, could be significant. So, but appreciate the answer. Yeah, yeah very appreciated. I, I, that's a good lesson for me to take away from today, from today's yeah. talk for sure. I would say uh, like more of the land or the products that come directly from the land, either by farming or any manufacturing process. So, what you're talking about, a real, you know, a big corporate entity taking a hold of it. I think. It, it does take that, but it also takes at the same time some kind of like grassroots availability or options. You know, these options need to be made available to have like this this level playing field to where it's not, hey, this huge mountain I've got to climb. In the past, we've seen people skipped over the corded phone and went right to the cell phone. So as much of these advances we could make and just spread it spread it evenly i think i appreciate you guys i appreciate i appreciate your time my dogs want to say hi too <laughs> yeah you know what that's a good point um that the maybe the food items for for safety reasons or for just for general provenance reasons as well things like um uh, like the, the the luxury items where they just are there are less of them and they are more they cost more and so there might be more um, appetite for for using nfts and tokens in that way uh, but also you know one thing before we we wrap up this whole um, discussion here i did want to ask you guys what do you think about key loss like does it mean that you would lose your ownership if you lost the key and is that something that we need to consider further uh, yeah, I, I think it's part of uh, the whole concept, right? If you if you lose your keys, you're pretty much uh, lost your NFT. I think maybe maybe that's a, p a problem in a real world uh, context that if you lose the keys to your car NFT, you might lose all the data. I don't know, or or not be able to access it. But yeah. I don't know exactly. But but for sure, I mean, you you put a part of the problem is also you put a lot of responsibility with the end user that has to manage security and and. Uh, to keep his data safe concerning his access to uh, to the NFT itself. Yeah. Yes, there has been some, uh, I think some other uh, blockchains looking into that same problem to where there's some kind of support to where like if you do lose your key that there's a you know password field or something like that to where it's an idea. I don't know if it's been, app that's more of a development question I would say because yeah, as far as I know, you lose your keys, you, you lose your coins. To answer your question, definitely. And there are different technologies out there that you know give people the ability to allocate third party or at least a second key or a second address to unlock those funds. So, you know, blockchain technology as a whole is is a very a very new ecosystem. We've been around for quite some time, but the technologies to make it easier to use and accessible are, are still growing. Um, so we've still got a long way to go. Indeed. Indeed. And, you know, speaking of a long way to go, we I feel like we barely touched on some things today. We didn't even talk, talk about um, using the NFT or the token as a key to access content. And you know, there's just so much more we could talk about. And of course, that's the beauty of having more Tokal Talks coming up in the future. And so with that, we're going to start wrapping up this episode for this week. And we really appreciate having our guests here. Jep, first of all, where, did you want to finish up with any final thoughts before we we hear about where we can find you yeah i just want to thank you for inviting me it's my it's my first nft related uh, interview so so uh, so it's a milestone for me thank you very much for having me and i i uh, yeah my, my website is is um, my name.com so chep.com tjep.com and you'll find all the info over there thank you very much for being here of course and uh, we welcome back anytime thanks Excel. Yeah, Exile, you too. Thank you for being here. 
where can we find out more about what you're doing? Yeah, appreciate it. Um, Exile 13, Chief Operating Officer of the Hemp Coin. We're at hempcoin.org. That's H E M P, as in Paul, C O I N, like Nancy, dot O R G. Uh, appreciate it. You guys have a beautiful day. All right. Thank you. So from there, we're going to go over to Nutella. You have any updates for us, info about the uh, Toco platform? Yeah, thanks. Um, so to start off, I kind of mentioned it earlier. We had the Cyber Komodos uh, collection launch, which was uh, really successful. There was 777 different Cyber Komodo uh, eggs going for sale, and uh, they managed to sell out in, in about 28 hours. So for the first first collection, big collection launch on uh, uh, Tockle, we're really happy with that. We've taken away a bunch of lessons, and uh, we've already made uh, fixes to the DAP to make it uh, more usable uh, and and work better for for our community. So that was uh, super exciting and super excited to see those guys hatch in about two weeks' time. So keep your eyes and ears peeled. Uh, and then from a development point of view, we had development announcement um, this week. So uh, the big things we're working on is the marketplace. So everyone's keen to to see that and uh, see where that's going. So if you are interested to have a look at the designs, you can join the Discord and have a look. Uh, in the announcements channel, or you can go down to the DAP design channel. And uh, Lenny, our um, developer, has been working away at the designs and has done a has recently done quite a big update to make it uh, a lot more usable as well. If you're interested to see that, definitely definitely check that out. And um, highly anticipated, we're uh, we're about to launch a new website. I'm not sure if uh, Tim wanted me to mention that, but um, spoiler alert, we've got a, a new website coming out that uh, is is really, really good. Daria has been working away at that and uh, super excited to get that out there so people can you know find the information a lot easier. Uh, it's uh, it looks incredible. Um, so really excited to to give that to the community, but uh, that's all I've got. Nice, very nice. All right, well, that about wraps it up for this episode of the Tokel Talk podcast. And I'm Giuliano, of course, on behalf of Nutella and the rest of the Tokel team, as well as Exile 13 and Chep. We really appreciate you coming around and, and listening to the conversation. Come back around, you know, if you uh, are here live, giving away NFTs. And yeah, other than that, we will see you again in two weeks. Stick around and stay tuned for more announcements to find out more about the show. We were talking about tokenizations, NFTs in the real world, and we hope that it's been enjoyable and entertaining for you, informative. I know I've taken away something from this. So again, thanks, everyone. I'm Giuliano. Goodbye. Thanks very much. <laughs>